Hello everyone, Chrysa, um, uh, uh, welcome and uh, good afternoon, as we say here in Wales, to the latest of uh, Stammer's um, a daisy chain of interviews. And what I mean by that is um, people are interviewing someone and then that someone is choosing someone else to speak to. So some of you may have seen me be uh, being interviewed by John T. Claypole uh, last month, uh, which I greatly enjoyed. Uh, my name, I should say by the way, is Owen Shears. I'm one of the patrons of Stammer uh, and I'm also a poet and a writer. Um, so I'm especially thrilled today to be joined by another poet, uh, the fantastic poet uh, Zafar Kunal. Um, before we uh, get going and I introduce you to uh, Zafar uh, properly, um, I'm just watching the participants numbers go up. Uh, so just a bit of housekeeping, I'm sure that uh, that all of you have done probably far too many Zooms over these last sort of 12 months. Um, so you'll know that there is the Q&A function, uh, which I will have open. So if you have any uh, questions for uh, Zafa uh, uh, throughout this talk, just uh, pop it into the Q&A and I'll keep an, an eye on those. Uh, Zafa and I will be having a conversation, um, but I'll be referring to those questions all the, way, uh, um, all the way through. And then we'll have around 15 minutes at the end where We'll focus on those and we'll be wrapping up around um, uh, sort of five to five. So uh, Zafar was uh, born in Birmingham. Um, he now lives in Yorkshire. Uh, his mother was English. His father was from uh, Kashmir, which, um, which is where he now lives. Uh, in 2014, Zaf published um, a pamphlet with the uh, Faber New Poets series, um, a very um, distinguished series and has been the starting point for uh, many of our finest poets over the last sort of 10 or 12 years. That same year he was a poet at the Wordsworth Trust um, in Grasmere, uh, where I was actually a few years before him, so that's something that we also share. And then his first uh, collection of poems, um, Us, was published in 2018 and was shortlisted both for the T.S. Eliot Prize and also for the Costa Prize for Poetry. Um, more recently, he had um, a residency at The Oval, and as a result of that, published um, a pamphlet of poems about cricket called Six. Um, I still think, though, that most impressively, Zaf used to work for Hallmark Cards as um, a creative writer. That was his official title. Um, so, Zaf, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Owen. Lovely to be with you. Yeah, it's great to see you. As well, um, and lovely to see your lockdown beard. <laughs> I've only just lost mine and I'm already missing it. Um, now, it's something of um, a truism, obviously, to say that poets are interested in language. You know, of course they are. Um, it's their primary tool, uh, it's their access to everything else. But returning to your first collection, Us, I was struck again how for you, um, poetry in your writing it's not just about an interest in language but language specifically I was struck spoken language is your subject again and again it's through language it's through uh, the really intimate detail of linguistic um, and the tensions within language and between languages it's not only where your poets start but it's it's the ideas of language through which you arrive at meaning and further ideas um, and I was struck, especially not just the tensions between different languages, your mother tongue and your father tongue, but also um, between sound and silence and between languages in time as well. Um, so there's a lot there, obviously, but I just wondered if you could start off by talking to us about that relationship with language and maybe some of your earliest memories of language and languages and where you think this deep, deep interest in how language works, where that starts, where did that begin? Well, that's, yeah, that, that, well, thanks for those sensitive points. And yeah, that's a really big question. Where did that begin? And I think I'm kind of obsessed with the idea of where, where I, I began and things. And, um, uh, but yeah, um, I think I was always a bit kind of um, guarded around language. Um, uh, and was quite a quiet kid um, and I suppose it took me a while to realise that my parents did have a different if you like mother tongue um, 
Um, I think there was a time when I thought they both came from the same language, if you know what I mean. They, they obviously looked very different. They had different religions. They, you know, that they, they, they were, you, you know, everything was different about them, really. Um, but there was a time when I almost felt they spoke the same language, and um, and I would hear in my father's words, at English we spoke home. Uh, sorry, at home we spoke English. Um, which, um, uh, and um, when my father's relatives would come around, um, I would hear English equivalents in his words. So, um, you know, I'd hear the nearest version. So, so, for example, if someone's pouring tea and someone wants to say enough or stop, they would say bus. And later on, I would see written down bus stop. And I thought, oh, that's good. There's like a translation. I was, and and it, I would see all these little, little convergences across the language. But I always, I always felt this sense that my parents were so different. Mm -hmm. And I almost felt like I occupied the gap in their difference. And I almost felt like I was a walking, living, breathing gap. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, um, but I was a very kind of hesitant, quiet, quiet child, way before any symptoms like stuttering showed up um uh which it showed up more when i was about 13 14 when things were probably difficult at home that then it became kind of a, this noticeable stutter but before then i was just like this quiet hesitant child i think um you said to me once that you that you sometimes thought that the stammer was almost a result of your interest in other people's language and in how other people spoke is that right in that you had yeah. a friend who stammered and, and you felt as though you were almost drawn into the quality of his speech. Yeah, well, there were a couple of people who were in my kind of group uh, at school who, who kind of stammered. Uh, um, uh, and yeah, I think I was curious about it. <laughs> and, and perhaps it just aligned with other insecurities at some stage. But, but yeah, I, I, I found that I couldn't stop once I became curious about it and perhaps perhaps in my head mimicked it or something to see how it would feel. Mm. Um, but then I felt it was like a coat that I couldn't take off after trying it on, you know, and, um, and yeah, I remember later on, I got a school report that came back that said, you know, he makes good interventions sometimes, but it's a pity about his uh, speech impediment. And that was the word they used. And that was the first time I'd ever seen anything kind of come back to me that was like solidi solidifying yeah. some of the issues that that may have been presenting like and I knew that I mumbled and I knew that I took you know that I had this hesitation and I knew that sometimes I was stammering but I never would put a word to it and and I remember the effect that had on me this speech this phrase speech impediment um yeah it was kind of I don't know it was um and what was that effect especially you know, coupled with the uh, with the concept of pity. I mean, obviously, you know, this is something that Stammer has been doing some great work around recently. How we talk about stammering, the whole language around stammering. So, yeah, I mean, well, can you remember how that did make you feel? I think it. I, I think I always felt a bit like like I could somehow wish it away or something. But this is going to make it hard for me to wish it away now. Mm. Um, it, you know, like a bit like in physics when they say once thing. A, a wave is observed it becomes a particle it was like oh god now i'm a particle i you know and it felt like that or something and i even looked the word up and and you know and it obviously it relates to the word like like foot doesn't it impediment like like pediatric and all that and um yeah. is that right no or pope oh uh, that's not right um and yeah it makes you think like you've got a foot in your mouth or something you know, <laughs> you know. but um, even then though even then you're you know, uh, uh, one of your instinctive responses was to go away and to look it up and to look at etymology. Yeah, yeah right. Well, look at what was the journey, the history of this word. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I literally looked it up in a dictionary, like, um, and yeah, I used to have this dictionary that my mum won at school because my mum was very, very articulate in English. You know, it's obviously her language, but she won this dictionary uh, in a kind of Latin competition at her grammar school, and. Um, yeah, and it just had the definition there, but but just by way of contrast, my, my father stopped going to school at the age of seven, you know, it was bombed somehow during partition and um, never 
educated beyond the age of seven when he arrived here um, for a job in the factories he he says that he learnt English from looking at shop signs and reading the signs on the shops and trying to work out what was in the shops and things like that and I, I don't quite know how that was possible but but that was how different they were you know that's one example of how different they were and my mum could quote you know, like the lines from Shakespeare and things and you know she, she, she became a mm. primary school teacher so she wasn't like academic or anything but but she just had this grammar school experience that was incredibly different you know um in, in Warwickshire in this little village in Warwickshire it's a very rich linguistic territory that isn't that I mean you know the 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 um extremity you know yeah. of those two linguistic experiences and there you are in the middle absorbing it all yeah that's right and I, and I associated my mum with with the language really funny enough and, and her her father um neither of my parents had brothers or sisters so there was not much big family but but we had a um my my, my granddad on my dad's side had died of a snake bite and um never met him and you know I, but I, I knew my english grandfather my, and my scottish grandmother was in an asylum most of her life and i never met her once but we'd sometimes visit my english grandfather and and he lived in this village in warwickshire and on on the way from birmingham to there there'd be this sign welcome to warwickshire shakespeare's country and there'd be this bear and staff i almost felt like oh and his next door neighbor was called shakespeare <laughs> And I, I, I used to imagine in my head that 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 somehow my mum had come from this like right. mum represented the language almost. She represented this pinnacle of language or something that was the exact opposite where my dad was from, you know. And uh, um, yeah, so and yeah, my my parents were re uh, randomly met in Stratford. That they they had their first date in Stratford upon Avon, and and. Uh, yeah, so for me, there's like books and Shakespeare language, all those things are in one box in my head, English right. and the dictionary and all these things. And then on the other hand is, is my father's kind of background and they always felt really different. And I always, yeah, I always felt like one will never touch the other. But of course they do in your poems. I mean, you know, that comes across you know, so strongly in the poems in us. I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels as though the place where they do touch each other and that they meet and that you explore you know the resonances of that meeting um is in poetry so i'm just wondering when did when did poetry enter the picture when did that become a place that you could explore and interrogate everything that you were that you were experiencing or feeling um it, it, i think it came I think it was always there in a weird way, but as an aspiration, it was quite late. Like I, I, I you know, I failed my GCSEs, had to resit them, um, and then I did quite well in my A levels because I actually started working. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I did politics at university, and um, I uh, yeah, I, I think poetry. I always had poetic feelings, if you know what I mean, um, and. I think partly the stuttering was was me caring about what what I was going to say a lot, probably too much, really. And um, so I think it was always there, waiting. To, it was waiting to happen for a long time. It, um, I was. Uh, it's very uh, interesting that two sides of the coin of uh, of uh, uh, caring about speech, because that's something that I very much um, identify with. You know the. The care that you will put into the language of a poem and then that very different kind of care sometimes when you're when you're speaking and you're worried about stammering you know and that care about the appearance of language and your own appearance um it would be lovely to hear some poems and and i, I think one of the poems you were you're offering to read is called just a minute which is drawn you know from that childhood that childhood um experience of uh, being in an environment of different languages um yeah would it yeah. be uh, possible to hear that now yeah great thank you um yeah so um yeah this is set in my kitchen or the kitchen i grew up in in birmingham uh uh kind of near spark hill mostly in birmingham and it's a very narrow kitchen in, 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 in this semi-detached house and the narrowness of the kitchen um also made me think of um uh, it made me remember this program that my mum used to like the radio four was always on uh 
and uh, my memory like just a minute and for me just a minute was like ni a nightmare because <laughs> the idea of speaking for a minute without hesitation <laughs> deviation or repetition um to me that minute felt like you know it's like swimming the channel or something like that <laughs> uh, and and yes, I said listen in like in horror and awe at, at this attempt and you know when the whistle would blow and someone had done done a minute it was quite an amazing thing um uh, but anyway, I was just thinking about how, how a minute is a very restricted space, but also if you, you know, and we live in these minutes and, and, and this kitchen where I used to hear just a minute was very narrow. And uh, anyway, so I'll read the poem. Just a minute. The whereabouts of things has gone, but I can see the radio on the right as you rummage in a drawer, same side as the sink. I can't reach up to the stiff tap as Birmingham water drums against that hollow tin base. I am splashed by what you say rushed down Welsh hills to this cupboarded corridor, the tightest room. All is at hand, you'd add, in our TARDIS meter here from our narrow clapped out kitchen. Above trapped voices, the running tap, the hammering accents of water. Still reaching, I turn as you explain the radio's cue to speak without hesitation, deviation or repetition. One subject, this span, undoable, I think, like swimming a length, small, stammering. The rules of the game rule out all my talk, even inside. A pause traps every impossible time. A draw that holds a draw that holds a weight. Any second she'll be there. Listen, you turn off the tap to cheers as the whistle blows. Our language, sorry, our laughter outlasts the long waves applause. Mm, thank you. Thank you. A pause traps every impossible time. That speaks to you know, so many of my childhood experiences. Um, uh, just looking at this poem on the page, I'm just going to hold it up to the screen. I don't know if people can see that, maybe not very well, but I'm struck by, you spoke earlier um, about how you felt that you were this sort of living gap. And I'm struck by how you'll actually use gaps and space on the page as yeah. a form of punctuation. Yeah. Um, is that something that, that came from your experience of speech or is that reading too much into it? No, it's not. No, it's reading... The right amount into it i think it's 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 and i like that you read read into the gaps the gaps are there to be read into as much as the words i think and um yeah i know that uh, if you look at if you look through the book you do see um gaps between stanzas and and within the line and and yeah those gaps are full i think they're, they're full of full of history and like you know, you picked on that line, um, a pause traps every impossible time. Yeah. And I think that's how, how it feels. It's like um, every pause, even though it's a nanosecond hesitation, it feels like history rushes into that space. It feels like um, personal history, other histories, all sorts of stuff. Maybe even the future, God knows. It, it, feels, like, it feels like these little moments um, dilate time and space or something and and that that's maybe what I was thinking at the back of my head with this poem just a minute that okay it might be a second or, or a minute or something but there's everything in it you know yeah. and, and I love that thought that. actually because it was only in conversation with you recently that that it was a thought that sort of crystallized but I realized it, it's something that I've felt all of my life that nearly every stammerer it has a very unique relationship to time because when you're in that moment of a stammer your language is existing in two places the word is already alive in your head but for everyone else in the room it isn't and you're yeah. bringing it into the future yeah, <laughs> and you're, you're, that's right. yeah. yeah and yet there's a part of you that's already there and yet for other people there'll be just this sort of absence yeah you know that's exactly right and i've always felt in a way i've got one foot in one place and one foot in another place mm. But, but it's also one foot in another time as well. You're right, because you're kind of at the end of the sentence almost. And sometimes I do reverse things because I've, I've kind of gone ahead or something. And so when I catch up with saying it, I've kind of reversed the order of the, the sentence or so. And, and, and yeah, in that little pause, 
a million possibilities suddenly arise mm -hmm. you know you, you know everything forks off it's like you know that robert frost poem you know the road not taken it's like every oh, the ev version of wood. yeah yes the two paths diverged and and that really means a lot to me and I, i'm a bit like that i can get to the end of a path and literally stop and think the whole you, you know my future depends on which decision i've taken and it, you know i get a bit silly about these things but um in speech that happens a lot and it's like it's almost like a, a black hole or something mm. and you know how, how this idea that the universe started with everything being densely packed and then it feels like these moments when you stop or you're stopped or you're at the beginning of something i like that it feels like if you if you could put a plug into it it would power everything it's like and everything is in that moment have you ever felt and not just as a writer because we've talked about i think the the attention and the care for language that i think you know having some form of disfluency you know or a stammer you can give you but just listening to you talk now about the other experiences and some of the more philosophical paths that can lead you down are you actually grateful for your experience of stammering and how it relates to your relationship with language um yeah i'd like it um yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always a bit funny when, when people talk about being grateful for things that are, are difficult, uh, you know, because, you know, some, for some people it can remain very difficult. Yeah. Things, but um, but I, I can t tell you that I know more and more that it's, it's part of me being a poet. Mm. And, um, and I've only caught up with this after the event, you know, like one of my sentences, you know, my sentences yeah. are often catching up after the event. And... Yeah, and just even in that thought that it makes me think about uh, the ground a sentence happens in, which is what poetry is all about. Poetry is the ground that a sentence happens in, you know, and and I, I wouldn't even think like that if, if I didn't have this kind of, you feel like jarring relationship sometimes to language and which I used, always used to think came from, if you like, my mixed inheritance and my, my my confusion about that was that it was very real when I was young. But I actually, more and more, I think it's something deeper than that. I and mean, I think that my autobiographical autobiograph stuff maps onto something a lot deeper that maybe, I don't know, it's in my soul or something, I don't, or my DNA, I just don't know. But, um, but yeah, it, it feels older than just having parents from different backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, as if it roots back to deeper generations than that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something that Jotty um, um, asked me. You know, he made the point that he was struck by how many poets seem to stammer, and yet, of all of the literary forms, you know, you could argue that poetry is the one that demands the most of um, specific rhythms and meter. Um, you know, and so if you add extra syllables, or if you know, you a stammer in the performance of the poem, you're really, you know, putting. Um, stick in the spokes of the poem you know you're really sort of uh, disrupting it um and i just wonder how did you find that transition because i know that there can be a real comfort in finding um a way of expressing yourself and a way of approaching these experiences on the page um in ink and then as we know you know uh, poets are expected to write poems but they're increasingly expected to also read those poems and so there's this uh, transition from silence into sound again and from mm. the page to the stage how did you find that when you started to perform or to read your poems um it's something that i was always worried about like in fact there was a time when when i decided that i wanted to write poetry where i, I thought but one day i'll have to read it out and that stopped me for a while and i remember reading about people like george mckay brown who used to like and that, that he rarely left his island of orkney and didn't do many readings and and i was pleased to read that because i thought okay there are people that, that don't have to read their poems and so maybe i can still like try to get published and, and not have to do that um and the first reading i actually gave was fair enough it was a poem called he'll speak um uh, I know you've got a poem like about the the kind of sh shale is it on on the, the hill and, and related yeah. to, to speech and and in a funny kind of way that that has a similar hill speak happens to be the nearest translation to my dad's language, uh, which is Pahari or mountain speech, and um, anyway this poem 
it was also about me expressing myself and it was one of the first ones where I kind of got my feeling into words and and this uh, won the two well, won a third prize in the 2011 poetry competition and that was the first reading I ever did like literally nothing before that like so you know I was got up on stage and it was at the you, you've been I'm sure it's this posh place in Mayfair and like Caroline Duffy was there and all, all, all you know Jackie Kay was one of the judges and I remember um I yeah I have to admit I had like three glasses of wine beforehand mm -hmm. and I decided that I wouldn't say anything before the poem I'll just read the poem and I I did it from heart because I knew it but also because I knew that if I looked down I'd mumble and 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 I was really worried that people wouldn't hear me. I, I thought I'm not going to somehow project my voice here at all. And I remember coming up, coming down after this thing, and um, and Jackie Kay, one of the judges, came over and and I, I, I'd not met her before then, and gave me a hug, and that made me cry. Wow. And, and, and then she said, "Oh, I'll just introduce you to Caroline Duffy," and I had this horrible. I had this thing where she said something nice and I cried again and uh, oh, <laughs> I, was, I wanted to hide I literally I like was like on her shoulder kind of and I didn't want to lift my head up because I was I was felt like I was making such a fool of myself and I just so, so anyway so but it was a very emotional thing even and what what it was was that people had heard me mm. I genuinely thought that they wouldn't actually they would say what did he say or, or, or good effort or something like that. I didn't think they would say, I really like that poem. Wow. Really, you know, that, I, yeah, it was, I was almost like a child crying with my mum or something at that point, you know, it was, yeah, I don't know. I can't explain that moment, but that was the first reading I ever did. And mortifyingly, I cried twice afterwards and I hope to, <laughs> but yeah, anyway. You know, I suspect that Carol Ann would have loved that. Um, I did um, a reading with her once and I was slightly out of it because early in the day uh, I'd fallen down um, a cattle grid and something under there had punctured my leg. Um, and I just sort of patched it up and just went on and I did this event. And obviously it got quite badly um, infected because I was all over the place. And after the reading, Carol Ann spent almost the entire night essentially tending to me Oh. And sort of giving me some paracetamol and you know, dressing the wound almost. So I think, you know, I think she'd love that. It would have spoken to her mothering instincts. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear um, another poem, but something just struck me listening to you then because the nature of your poetry, as we're about to hear, and I should say to everyone, this is a poem that is pretty much unpublished. I think it's been published in Poetry Island, but that's it, uh, called Foxglove Country. But as you'll hear in this poem, you go into such a depth to into the nature and the character of an individual word that actually the performance of your poems feels like their ultimate end. It's feel like we need to hear these poems on the air. We need to hear them in a voice because it is about spoken uh, a language as opposed to written language that you keep returning to, isn't it? it is, yeah, and I think part of that is is this awareness also when I was young that I, I, I got before I knew these words that my dad was from the kind of oral culture where things just weren't written down very much and so he doesn't even know the year he was born because it wasn't written down and things um and uh yeah and I just yeah uh, I might, whereas my mum is from this print culture that I, I I say I kind of relate to the English language and Shakespeare and all these things but but that, that was one of the many kind of if you like binaries in my life was this oral mm. tradition or something or, or culture and this print culture that I almost felt like my mother and dad or something <laughs> um so so yeah i always feel there's a big difference between print and sound like right. and to me that's mum and dad and can i get them together yeah wow. yeah well it would be great to hear foxglove country it's okay foxglove country sometimes i like to hide in the word foxgloves in the middle of foxgloves the exclo is hard to say out of the england of its harboring word Alone, it becomes a small tangle, a witch's thimble, hard to toll, bell, elvish door to a door, exclo, a place with a locked beginning, then a snag, a glu, like the little Englands of my grief, a knotted dark that locks light in glisten, glow, glint, gleam, 
and Oberon's banks of Eglantine, which closes in on the opening of Gulliver, whose shrunken gull says rose in my fatherland. Meanwhile, in the motherland, the exger is almost the thumb of a lost mitten, an impossible interior, deeper than forests and further in, and deeper inland is the gulp, the gulf, the gap, the grip that goes before love. Um, Beautiful, of... thank you. Dear oh, thank you. I always say when I'm teaching, uh, you know, what you're looking for in a poem is a poem that will change your experience of a small part of life for the rest of your life. And, you know, I will never look at a foxglove or oh. hear the word foxglove in the same way. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, there's one line, if it's all right, I, I don't, don't want to get you know, too sort of uh, geeky in, but, but I just wanted to ask you about that line in the middle, then a snag, a, a glut in the little Englands of my grief, because that line seemed to me to have, you know, it seemed to cast several shadows at once, the little Englands of my grief. I mean, would it be okay to just have you unpack that for a bit? No, that, I, I think that's the centre of the poem, actually. I think you, you, you're spot on to pick that out. To me, that feels like the centre of gravity um, and the glow. Glow is also in England, isn't it? Um, and the little Englands of my grief. I suppose that line came out naturally. It, 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 and um, I think these moments of hesitation in the middle of a word and the moment snags, if you like, snagging. And snag has a g sound as well um it's like the heart of a country heart of my kind of inner country or something it feels like and maybe yeah these little englands of my grief are these rich seams of stucknesses you know um these stucknesses that never leave us and maybe that poetry comes out of mm. you know, the little englands of my grief i don't know yeah, no, no, that makes sense to me, certainly. Um, we're going to carry on talking for a while, but I just want to um, remind people that you can post your questions in the Q&A section uh, if you've got anything specific that you want to ask Zach. I see that some are coming through on the chat, um, as well as people saying that they're really enjoying the poems. So thanks, Zach. Um, I suppose talking about um, England and Englishness, you know, there's a lot of sort of questioning um, and also a love of um, specifically English countryside, I'd say, as opposed to British, and Welsh or Scottish. Um, and I mentioned earlier that you spent some time as a poet at the Oval. Uh, I know that you've always played cricket, but it feels as though you immersed yourself there into the, you know, into this most English of games. And if I, I should say that the, the first poem in Us is a poem called Fielder, which is all about you going off to find um, a ball that's been you know, leathered for six out of, um, out of the boundary and suddenly finding yourself in that sort of English, you know, pastoral place. Um, oddly, I spent some time with the Welsh Rugby Union as their writer in residence as well. And I think this, I think I'm right in saying that there's something that we both ended up thinking about, which was this relationship to our own experience of language and the amount of uh, focused and conscious thought we put into language against, sometimes in sport, this world of no language, this world of instinct, this world of flow. Um, I'm just wondering if you can speak a bit about your time at the Oval, what was that like going in as a poet into the world of cricket, but also specifically about this concept of, uh, of the release from language in sport, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I felt really at home with that commission, actually. Um, yeah, I, grew, I grew up near Edgebaston Cricket Ground in Birmingham, or not too far away, and you know, I had trials for Warwickshire and cricket was a big part of my youth. And, um, and yeah, it was a place where I think instincts were everything. And, and it felt like um, my best moments were way without language, just, you know, and you know, language didn't even exist in my best moments, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, and, um, and I've got, got this, and I found that actually the poems came really easily about cricket because I thought in that Fielder poem, which is the first poem in my book, a book like that Hillspeak poem is one of the first poems I felt I really got my feeling of being in the world into, into words here. And um, 
you know, I didn't have a plan to write more cricket poems, but I found that there's such a muscle memory of that. I don't know if, because I played it so much and it was so physical. Mm. And it, and I suppose there's a huge lexicon around cricket, you know, like leg glances, all these terms that you can exploit. But um, really what, what it was interesting for me was that it, 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 the muscle memory of playing the game wasn't really connected to language. And, but yet it, it drew me into, it drew me into the, into the body, into, into the, you know, the, the act of playing a shot. And I felt I could write more flu fluently about that because right. it, somehow, because there was this muscle memory and, and, and yeah, in this poem, Leg Glance, um, I was partly remembering an actual leg glance shot. Um, um, but I was also remembering taking guard and in cricket, you take guard, you know, and the way you stand is part, uh, and you ask the umpire for, for a kind of, whether your bat's in front of middle or leg or middle and leg or something like that, and, and, and you hit the ground, and, and this, is, this is where you take your guard. And um, I hated that moment when I would have to say, leg stump, please, or middle and leg or middle, because you had to get your voice to go to, the other side of the wicket which is 22 yards away and I could bowl a ball 22 yards and make it do all sorts of things but to get my voice that far to this um, to this umpire that I'd never met before I hated that moment um anyway so no, no, it's so funny yeah. that you talk about that you know because <laughs> I you know I played rugby all through you know school you know, teens and, and early 20s and you know I spoke about this in the um interview with John T. I think I partly threw myself into rugby because it was it sounds as though you didn't, but I, I held quite a lot of frustration and anger about my stamina, especially in my teens. And so rugby was this world where it was purely physical, you know, and I could try and tackle guys much bigger than me and quite often fail, but there was something very complete in that action. But as the scrum half, I used to have to uh, uh, call out the line-out calls. And, you know, every team has its certain code words, and sometimes there'd be a certain word that I couldn't say. And people will start going, how come we're never throwing to the middle of the line out, Owen? It's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be standing here trying to say the word and I can't. So I've used one of the other ones instead. So, yeah, that's very interesting. Those moments when language suddenly intrudes into a space where you think, actually, I don't want it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not here for the words. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm just reading one of the Q&As here from uh, Jonathan Reed. Um, she says, I'm a member of a local poetry group. We mix open mic with invited poets. I force myself to read out my poetry at these events. This Zoom helps me to remain enthusiastic. Well, that's good, Jonathan, thank you. Um, one comment I've received is that, my, is that my unintended blocks and pauses uh, give listeners time to better appreciate my words. I was surprised and pleased uh, by this. Have you had any similar feedback? Or, or have you had any feedback about about the quality of your speech and the poetry and how it might enhance the experience <laughs> or to give it depth. Um, uh, yeah, no, thanks for those points. And uh, yeah, I have, uh, yeah, people often say, use the word staccato, which I can't ever say. Um, yeah. um, but they, they say that but perhaps, and, and again, I didn't know that I was doing this until they said, but they would sometimes say that I spoke differently in the poem and yeah, I remember I once did a reading with Simon Armitage and I think he said that I, I was emphasizing certain words and he was trying to imagine where they lay on the page and and actually the way they are on the page doesn't reflect how I've necessarily said them and the spaces that I put in between them I think that was just me trying to get the poem across like all I want is for the poem to come across um, and perhaps I do emphasize just I say it word by word sometimes and but I didn't know I was doing that. Um, uh, but but, but I, I think the main I don't know about you and but I, I think the main thing is you get a sense of who someone is. And if I were if I were really slick, which I'm totally not, I don't think it would suit my poems. And I, you know, and that really helped me to think actually, even if I get things wrong, and I've had horrible moments where I've stopped in a poem sometimes, um, you know, and, and just got a bit lost. Um, but but it's kind of you as long as you're you it's okay and that's what's beautiful about poetry so, mm. you know. and vital because actually if there's anything that will sniff out in that will sniff out in all in author in authenticity um it's a poem you know as you yeah. know 
you know that's quite often if a poem isn't working it's because it isn't it isn't being true and that that's reminded me of when i saw um the fantastic irish poet kieran carson read once at the royal festival hall and he'd been fluent and suddenly in the middle of it he wasn't he hit a word and it was just like a jackhammer mm. and it was amazing you know and then he did it a few more times in the reading and it's one of the it was one of the best readings that i've ever been to i think exactly for that reason suddenly mm. all of him came through and was carried in the poem mm. yeah and i also i also often i kind of do them from memory but partly because i do know them um just from working on them and things um and uh it was just how it started for me it started that day when i first did the reading i just carried on doing that um but there are times when i i've completely forgotten as well what what the next line was and uh that you know the gulf that opens up at that moment is just huge and uh but you know you, you don't die you know you die on stage, you die on stage but you, you know things carry on and it's good to know that actually you know people people still listen to you know what yeah. you say you know and, and actually in a world that i think feel is increasingly being brought up in the speed of flow you know online and the way that everything speaks to each other and everything flows into everything else you know, I find myself saying to people, you know, isn't it wonderful if you're speaking to someone who stammers and there's a gap, there's a pause, you know, enjoy that time. Enjoy, mm. you know, enjoy that different rhythm and enjoy that space. I mean, and I know, I know it's not that easy. I know that, you know, you know when I do it you know, myself, it can be, it can be very difficult, but I feel as though there is, there is something that is worthwhile you know, listening to there. Um, I've just got another couple of questions that have come through on the chat, actually. Um, First is that uh, Patrick Campbell mentions Emily Dickinson and the uh, dash in her poetry. And um, he's intrigued by how your writing on the page might reflect a uh, disfluency. He says that uh, Connor Foran is an artist trying to create a font that stammers, a disfluent mono, to reproduce the sensation of stammering and disfluency in text form. Well, that sounds fascinating. I just wonder, have you experimented, you know, beyond the gap in the poem? in terms of representation of the disfluency? And no, no uh, well, that, um, I, like the, I like the point about M.A. Dickinson and the dash, like, um, I do like dash or M dashes as they're known. Oh. Um, I, you know, I love the long dash. Um, I would use more of them if, um, that, um, yeah, I feel at home with the long dash and I don't know why. Um, it kind of connects, it's like, I suppose I'm a bit of a dash in between things, I feel like. Um, so perhaps perhaps it's that, and it doesn't stop a sentence, mm. it, but yeah, it, 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 it's a, it allows another beginning. That's what I like about it. So a comma is not quite the same. Uh, as a, a, a dash between things. It means everything can go on, which I like. And, but at the same time, you've got a bit of a stop. Moment. Yeah. And I yeah. like, you know, and you're kind of in between, you know, it's it's about actually next time that I block or I stammer, I'm gonna see it in my mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> it as, as a long dash, actually. Because then it's actually this is all still continuing. Yeah. But I, I love Emily Dickinson as well, and you know, the compression in her poems, it's all about compression, and she's trying to get so much into a small space. Um and yeah, yeah, and she, yeah. Um mm. yeah, the, 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 the dash fit feels like it again, it, it occupies a whole there's a whole kind of universe in that in that space. Yeah, um, just looking. I'm keen to hear another poem before we end. We're going to be uh, wrapping up in about five minutes, but there's um, another couple of questions here. I'll just put them both together because maybe they're kind of linked. I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, someone here has asked. You mentioned in your first reading you were touched that people focus on what you had to say instead of how you were saying it. Do you have any advice for people who stammer on how to do the same? I must admit that was a that was a big breakthrough for me when someone said, you know, focus on what you have to say, not how. No, that that's that's really moving. Yeah, that, that's what it's all about, really. Um, um, and I suppose I suppose ultimately, like, it's the it's the kind of link between you and what you have to say, um, and. Like that, the two things become the same. Like talking about like Shakespeare, like I looked up the amount of time he used the word gesture in his plays, and it's ten. And um, and 
I sense with his work that like he was the most his most articulate of writers who could say what he wanted almost but yeah he didn't trust words he didn't I don't think he he really trusted characters that could speak perfectly actually mm -hmm. I think he trusted the gesture I think he trusted the sermon in the stone and the tongue in the trees you know and um and the gesture was the ultimate kind of noble speech or truth speech really uh, and and fluency in words wasn't necessarily connected to truth i think um yeah. and and that helps me when i think about that that actually even our even our forms of inarticulacy or or our body stopping us speaking they're articulate in their own ways and in a funny kind of way, stuttering is a very eloquent way to say something about what you're feeling. Absolutely, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think one of my breakthroughs was when I realised being articulate and being fluent are not the same thing. Yeah. Thing, you know, very much so. Yeah. Um, I'm keen to get to your poem because mm -hmm. I've read it and it's fantastic and oh, it's a great place to close, but I'm also keen to get these questions in quickly. Um, so... Heidi De Quincey, what a great name, uh, asks, could you share how you cope with the anxiety that can come with expressing yourself if you're unsure how it will be or, you know, how that expression will come out? Um, I'm not sure I'm very good at that. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure I'm very good at that. So, but I, I this, this thought that what, whatever happens, it will be you and like it or lump it, that, that helped me in a weird way that being slick would never be me anyway. And so even if I would like to be this charismatic person that could speak fluently, that's not me probably. So, um, and also uh, slowing down. I think for me, like when I was at school, I never had any therapy for it, but what helped me was I just stopped speaking for a while. I'm not re recommending that, but I, I just became very quiet, but I, I would only speak when I felt comfortable or something or like uh, and I slowed down um and sometimes when you go on stage or something there's a tendency to kind of like you know gallop away or something and um yeah I think slowing down for, for me not just on stage but in general um can help yeah it's all about management of time isn't it it's how we there's something else that a poem uh, does ask of you it asks you to, to slow down not just in the reading of a poem um, yeah. as a reader, but if you're performing your own poem, uh, I find that that's how, I mean, poetry helped me to become fluent because, uh, yeah, partly through asking me to slow down, to give the language space, I think. Yeah. Rather and, more fluent. And there's a beautiful, beautiful thing in a reading where, where the, the energy between the listening and the speaking starts to feel like it's, um the same thing or something mm. um and it's about that it's not about me delivering something it's about me kind of hearing the listening and and then feeling really moved by the listening to try to express some you know the poem better or something and the quality of listening i think is part of part of the act of the reading um it's partly maybe why the book is called us you know to me the reader makes it you know if you pick out a line that, and you read it well you've made that poem as much as I have you know yeah 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 it is it's a chemical reaction that only happens when the reader enters it isn't it really yeah yeah um, we just got one more question which I think we can answer pretty quickly because to my mind this goes to the heart of so much of our conversation it's from Peter Wilkinson he says do you both think that as stammerers we explore language more because we think about it more than most? Um, for my part, Peter, yes, I think undoubtedly, even if that for uh, many years happened unconsciously and now perhaps, perhaps happens more consciously, yeah, I'm convinced, I'm convinced. I've got a completely different relationship with language uh, because of some of my struggles with it. I don't know if that speaks to your experience too, Zach. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think it's made me aware of the micro things in language. Um, so often, I, I, I yeah, I almost a word feels like the letters it's made of, or something like that. And um, and and I know I wouldn't have had that experience without without this kind of uh, slightly 
hesitant approach within and around words mm. um so so yeah it's it's made words a kind of like that foxglove yeah word, it's almost like the word itself is the is the foxglove that i'm a bee going in and out of it and and the, you know uh, that the word is the sensitivity to, to language is definitely being heightened by the experience of stuttering and, and also the feeling that you're not in control. Yeah, like, yeah. That, I'm, that language is this fear that somehow I'm responsible for, and yet I'm not. I, I, I feel it's like I can't I, I'd be responsible for the holes that turn up in the road that I'm walking in. That's how it feels like. It feels like a sentence is a road with holes in, and I'm being asked to run through it. And 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 but then there's holes that drop that drop into that and yeah. and you, you don't know where they're going to be and so it makes you feel like you're not in control um and and actually as a poet you're not in control fully are you no. the best poems you 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 you're not in control the worst ones you are exactly god i could talk about that for a long time but um, <laughs> we've sort of come to the the end of our time but i really want to finish on this poem which is um another new poem called leg glance which i really feel brings us full circle and back to so many of our conversations, um, or rather so many elements in our conversation um, from the sort of etymology that you have there um, under the title, but also speaking about this world of sport in which, in which, lag, in which language you know, can be absent and what, that, and what that opens up for you as well. So, um, so Zaf, well, actually, uh, just before you read uh, Leg Glance, maybe I can just make a couple of sort of housekeeping things, which is to say, um, Stammer are holding uh, weekly uh, music uh, workshops, uh, social music sessions at four o'clock every Friday. So if you're interested in that, do, uh, check those out. I think there'll be information on the website. And the infamous or the famous uh, Stammer pub quiz uh, is going to be back on June the 15th, I think. So there'll be stuff about that on the website as well. Um, but after that rather sort of practical stuff, we'll go back to the poems. Um, I would like to thank you, Zaf, uh, before you read this, for that conversation. I, I could speak to you all day, all week. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, so thanks for joining us. Uh, and it would be lovely if you could if you could leave us with a new poem. Well, thanks, Owen. It's always a good pleasure to uh, speak to you. Um, yeah, so this is called Leg Glance, and um, there's a kind of little note underneath um, from a dictionary. Logos, noun from Proto-Indo-European -Indo logo, suffixed from root of leg, to collect, gather. Leg glance, flexing my knee, taking my guard. I looked up and spoke in a breaking voice. Middle and leg, please. There is a steadier me who's always stood even further in the middle at actions remove, mostly silent, in silence's own ground. I know this from way back. For instance, facing a fast bowler off a long run and flicking the ball from in front of my pads for an eventual four, splitting the two fielders behind me who run towards each other at the rope in hope for a small eternity, the ball vanishing into a late May hedge, its slow time confetti dropping ahead of summer and foxgloves. Their countless nodding heads, all of which I witnessed as though I wasn't at the center of the echoing shot as I pivoted slightly on one foot. I say this, and yet there was no ligament of language, not a word in my head, or all was one word in that pool around the shot I played until I saw the scoreboard flap the change and registered the clapping. Sorry, I had to read that on the screen. No, no, that was fantastic. And I feel as, I hope I can hear the applause, the clapping now as well for that, as you should have. So that was a bit slick, wasn't it? Yeah, after such a <laughs> yeah. nuanced poem. Um, hey, thank you so much, Zaf. Um, someone has asked, how do we follow uh, Zaf's work? That's a very good question. Um, um, Us is published by Faber, um, as was his first pamphlet. I think six, the, the, um, the cricket poems were also published by Faber, is that right? That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically Faber and all good bookshops. If you are buying online, can I recommend bookshop.org, which is like Amazon, but for independent bookshops, which we love. Um, 
But yeah, thank you so much, Stamma. Thank you to everyone else for joining. Uh, and thank you most of all to you, Zaf. No, thank you. Stay safe. <laughs> thank you. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Yeah.